I V M. Her brow furrowed, her face grim and determined. She prepared to question the old man. The sacrificial pavilion is crowded with the rich and powerful and educated people that she has known and debated for years. Her eyes sting with the smoke. Her throat is hoarse from shouting to be heard over the cacophonies of those who would drown out her voice. Her palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms heavy. She only has one shot and she cannot miss her chance to blow. Gargi Vachak Navi raises her voice and she begins to argue with the great theologian. Yagnya Valkya, tell me, since this whole world is woven back and forth on water, on what then is water woven back and forth? On air, Gargi. On what then is air woven back and forth? On the worlds of the intermediate region, Gargi. On what are the worlds of the intermediate region? Woven back and forth. On the worlds of the Gandharvas, Gargi. On what are the worlds of the Gandharvas woven back and forth? On the worlds of the sun, moon and stars, Gargi. On what are the worlds of the sun, moon, stars woven back and forth? On the worlds of the gods, Gargi. On what are the worlds of gods woven back and forth? On the worlds of Indra and Prajapati, Gargi. On what are the worlds of Indra and Prajapati woven back and forth? On the worlds of Brahman, Gargi. On what then are the worlds of Brahman woven back and forth? Don't ask too many questions, Gargi, or your head will shatter apart. You are asking beyond a deity that should not be asked beyond. Enough questions, Gargi. Gargi looks around at the faces of the crowd, scandalized, sneering, thoughtful, encouraging. Her mouth is dry, her mind bursting with questions and ideas. But there are others awaiting a turn at Yagnivalkya, and the sacrificial rituals must continue. So she stays silent for now. My name is Anirudh Kanesetti. Welcome to Echoes of India, a history podcast. The words you've just heard are from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, which literally means the secret doctrine of the great forests. It was composed during one of the great turning points of the history of the Indian subcontinent, a time when cities were first beginning to take shape in the Gangetic plains. a time when many of the philosophical ideas and concepts that would shape this land for thousands of years were starting to emerge it's a pretty fascinating and unique text not just because of the episode we've just witnessed a woman challenging a male ritual expert in a sacred text is basically unheard of in human history up to this point but did the events depicted here actually happen were gargi and yagnivalkya the man she was debating with real people If not, what can we learn about the changing societies, polities and religions of the Gangetic Plains in the 7th or 8th century BCE, a couple of centuries before the emergence of the Buddha, whom we met in the last episode? Over the next half hour or so, we'll dive into everything from the evolution of the caste system to how the concept of rebirth appeared in India. We've currently jumped back a few centuries from our first episode, but we can only understand the huge historical impact of the man called Buddha. and the fascinating unique context of the early indian kingdoms and empires that he shaped if we go back first to a time when none of these existed in the first episode of the season we very quickly ran through how cities and civilizations emerge when we're hovering over human societies at such a great height watching the blooming and withering of so many generations as though they were no more than ants It's easy to forget that these are real people we're talking about. It's easy to forget that no farmer or hunter gatherer sets out with a clear idea in mind of how they want their societies and polities to evolve. 
Gradually, gradually, every generation makes choices shaped by their circumstances, and in the process, they make the world that their descendants will inhabit. So, what were the circumstances that led to cities and kingdoms, priests and renunciants emerging in the Gangetic Plains in the late 1st millennium BCE? Why is it that what we think of as Indian civilization today emerged with all these fundamental features instead of, say, transforming into a utopia of anarchist atheists? To answer that question, we have to go back even further in time, to when the great compendia of rituals and hymns known as the Vedas were beginning to take shape in the 2nd millennium BCE. The people who composed the Vedas were chariot riders who called themselves Aryas or Noble Ones, and they revered war, cattle, horses, and a plant called the Soma. They worshipped deities of storm and sun, wind and water. But this does not mean that they were primitive people. Their theology was very dense and complex and evolved over many centuries. Their religious ideas can be best summarized by saying that they believed that fire sacrifices allowed an interaction between the world of men and the world of the gods. The Aryas thought that the gods needed these constant sacrifices so that they could order the seasons, the motions of the stars, and bless them in battle. All these are evident in this hymn from the Rig Veda, their most ancient compendium of hymns. It was carefully transmitted orally through generations of priests before being written down in a radically different time and place, which the Aryas could never have imagined. And it's truly amazing that we can easily access these words that were intoned around flickering sacrificial fires over 3000 years ago. What time, first springing into life, thou nade, proceeding from the sea or upper waters, limbs of the deer had thou, and eagle feathers? O steed, Thy birth is nigh, and must be lauded. Yama art thou, O horse, thou art Aditya. Trita art thou, by secret operation. Thou art divided thoroughly from Soma. They say, thou hast three bonds in heaven that hold thee. Now, the Aryas frequently went to war with each other and with other tribes living in northern India stealing each other's cattle and basically enslaving each other to work their fields, tending their herds and making crafts. Though the Aryas were initially migratory herders, it wasn't long before the indigenous tribes of the land, who were more sedentary and agricultural, began to intermarry with and influence the way the Aryas thought about life. The Vedas showed that the Aryas had a rather complex relationship with these peoples, whom they called the Dasas. In some places, Dasas are described as high and haughty, in others, the god of war and storms, Indra, is requested to strike them down and is praised for breaking open their walls. Some leaders of these indigenous peoples would be incorporated into the top layer of Arya society, and it seems possible that ritual experts of both Arya and Dasa birth help shape the evolving Vedas, becoming incorporated into a caste called the Brahmins. Meanwhile, some Dasa war chiefs were incorporated into groups of aristocratic Arya families called the Rajarnyas. These were societies that were obsessed with lineage and descent and took great pride in being descended from famous chiefs or priests. Birth was also a major factor in determining how much of a slice of your tribe's wealth you got every year. After the end of the harvesting and raiding season, families belonging to a tribe would travel from across their assorted pastures and fields to gathering sites where great sacrifices of cattle, goats, crops, and the stoma drug were performed. The wealth that had been gathered through war and agriculture would first be given to the gods through sacrifice, then to Brahmin priests who conducted the sacrifice, and it was then distributed among the senior and junior lineages of the clan. In general, it was the junior lineage called the Vish who were responsible for ensuring that there was enough agricultural produce to ensure that all this was taken care of. And so the Vish were given conquered lands and gradually lost their prominence in the war-focused tribal assemblies, taking on the form of a caste called the Vaishyas, which literally means of the Vish. Meanwhile, the senior lineages who were in charge of war took on the form of a caste called the Kshatriyas, the powerful ones. And at the very bottom of this emerging social structure were people called the Shudras, made up of people of quote-unquote low birth, of subjugated tribes 
and groups of indigenous people who had not assimilated into the culture at the highest levels of Arya society. These guys did the actual work of toiling in the fields, but they were considered so ritually impure that they were not even allowed into the fields where sacrifices were performed and the redistribution of the tribe's wealth happened. Now, as their populations grew, these tribes warred with each other savagely, constantly searching for new lands to settle in. As a tribe settled in an expanse of land, these territories came to be known as Janapadas, literally where the people have put their feet. The tribes and their Janapadas spread east, fighting and subjugating each other and the peoples already living in these lands, some following the course of the great river Ganga, others moving along the foothills of the Himalayas. They settled in small villages, rarely with populations of more than 500 people, usually along rivers or lakesides. Life for these early Indians was tough, but it was certainly full of everyday beauties. Flocks of water birds in the marshes, the looming heights of distant mountains, the fire in the hearts of tiny huts, the careful painting of rough grey pots with fish, flowers, dots and stripes, fragments of which we are still discovering today, by the way. But there were more and more people, and the annual gatherings of tribes were growing crowded. Rituals became more complex, and families of Brahmins and Kshatriyas required larger amounts of agricultural and craft production to sustain their lifestyles and their occupations. By around 700 BC, for example, Brahmin families performed daily fire sacrifices, sacrifices at the new and full moon, sacrifices every spring, rainy season and autumn, and the harvest sacrifices, to say nothing of the great horse and soma sacrifices. Major rituals required Brahmins from different family lineages, each of whom specialize in a different Veda and a different aspect of the sacrifice. The priest designated as a Hothar was responsible for recitation of verses and had to come from a Rig Vedic family. The Advaryu, who was responsible for preparing the sacrificial ground and killing, butchering and cooking the sacrificial animal, had to come from a Yajur Vedic family, and so on. All these families would gain land, cattle and other forms of wealth in return for performing these sacrifices for war chiefs. And as we saw earlier, Vaishya families were being given parcels of land to be worked by Shudra labour in order to sustain this growing complexity in consumption. Different kinds of foods and crafts had to be traded for, and we can see an awareness of these new crafts and occupations in contemporary texts. In the beginning of this episode, for example, Gargi continually refers to reality as being woven back and forth, just as textiles are woven in layers. But there's also archaeological evidence to support these claims. We see tribes beginning to issue coins, set up trading centers and building roads, in a kind of never-ending cycle, increasingly complex and stratified societies led to increasingly complex economies. All this activity could not be handled by simple tribal councils. Gradually, gradually, this society of pastoral warrior lineages and their sedentary tributaries was beginning to transform into a very different beast, one that needed to be ruled by kings and organized by administrators. We'll talk more about this emerging state apparatus in the next episode, but for now let's focus on the Brahmin lineages who left us the texts that survived from this period. This brings us once again to the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, a compilation assembled by Brahmin families who specialize in one particular group of Vedic texts who call themselves the White or Shukla Yajurvedans. These Brahmins were usually settled around the easternmost extent of the Janapadas, deep in the Gangetic Plains. In this region, something very new was happening. The Kshatriya military aristocracy had managed to sideline other institutions of the ruling tribe, such as the annual assembly, and concentrated power in the hands of single dynasties. Official positions such as the royal bard, general and the distributor of tribute, which were granted to non-kinsmen, were beginning to emerge, concentrating power in the hands of royalty, and this royalty were trying to present themselves as having been divinely appointed to rule not just their own tribe, the Janapada, but many others, sprawling territories called Mahajanapadas. To do so, these rulers needed status, which meant that they needed to perform massive sacrifices and try to attract ritual experts who understood the power and meaning of Vedic rituals, 
which were already centuries old by this point. One particular individual, a king called Janaka of Videha, seems to have invested considerable resources in this ancient equivalent of R&D, giving Brahmins wealth in the form of cattle and gold to attract them to his sacrifices and convince them to settle in his territory. As you can imagine, researching rituals didn't exactly lead to scientific innovation, but it did lead to philosophical innovation. Brahmin families who competed for royal largesse ended up facilitating the concentration of royal power and gradually developed very advanced metaphysical ideas. These ideas would shape minds for many generations afterwards, even though the Upanishads that these Brahmin families composed, which literally mean secret or esoteric doctrine, were usually only transmitted through the uppermost strata of society, from male Brahmin teacher to male Brahmin student. Now, just as we like to pretend today that ideas and concepts from one part of the world are the OG and superior to other places, so did the Brahmins of this time. The Brahmins of Kurupanchala, roughly the upper and middle Gangetic plains where the earliest Janapadas had formed, liked to pretend that they had the most orthodox doctrines, the deepest understanding of rituals, and the society that was truest to that of the Rig Veda. None of this was true, of course, but of course they would say that. Now, the Brahmins of Videha, who were off to the east, were considered to be rather Boris chaps from an uncivilized frontier region, a Mlecha Desa. And so in their text, they tried to prove their own superiority by poking a lot of fun of the Brahmins of Kurupanchala. This sort of thing is very evident in their great text, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. And so we come at last to Yagnivalkya and Gargi, whose debate we attended at the beginning of the episode. This argument comes from the third book of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, when King Janaka of Videha conducts a lavish sacrifice, bringing together Brahmins from a number of regions who debate to see who has the deepest knowledge of the ritual and who will therefore get the chunkiest cows from the king. In this book, Yagnivalkya, who may have been a historical figure, perhaps one of the most important theologians of the white Yajurvedids, shows up to the sacrifice and proceeds to defeat and then roast a whole bunch of rivals. Now, some of these rivals, such as Uddalaka Aruni, show up in other texts such as the Chandogya Upanishad, where they are depicted as wise know-it-alls descended directly from Brahma the creator. And so, by depicting Yagnivalkya defeat them in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, what its composers are trying to say to their students and direct descendants is this. We are the smartiest. Videha is the bestest. Listen to us, not the Kurupanchala Brahmins. Now, all that is fair enough, but I'm sure you're wondering, why is Gargi so prominent in the text? <coughs> uh, yeah? Ah, you listen here. Now, young fellow. How can I help you, uncle? See, Vedic society was very egalitarian and progressive. I myself never faced any discrimination. And I worked very hard to get the king to give me cows and gold. We only want to perform sacrifices for the good of the society. Now, of course, for that, we deserve to get paid for it. Why not? Eh? Ah, I see we've been blessed by a visitation from one of the composers of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Well, sir, we'll come back to all your claims in a while. But could you first explain the next few lines? And I quote from Book 6, Chapter 4, Verses 6 and 7 of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. A woman who has changed her clothes at the end of her menstrual period is the most auspicious of women. When she has changed her clothes at the end of her menstrual period, therefore, one should approach that splendid woman and invite her to have sex. Should she refuse to consent, he should bribe her. If she still refuses, he should beat her with a stick or with his fists and overpower her, saying, I take away the splendor from you with my virility and splendor. Oh, ho. Oh. Cherry picking, you are, eh? are you? Oh, I can also do that. See, how about a few verses later, verse number 17, when we talked about a ritual to conceive a learned daughter. Eh? Why don't you talk about that? Eh? Why? Why not? Of course I will. But you might not like the answer. In the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, women are generally treated as suited for nothing more than taking care of the household and bearing children for the great and wise and learned men who possess the secret knowledge of the Upanishad. But as always, I will admit that things are more complicated than they might first seem. 
no 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 see see look here we need someone to manage our houses no correct or not now what more do women want oh these modern people the upanishads contain for example some rather hair brain rituals that are meant to make one's wife's lover's penis fall off and all sorts of injunctions never to flirt with your guru's wife why well since a lot of these marriages were based primarily on considerations of connections between elite men and the division of domestic labor it appears that wives were often much younger than their grumpy upanishad composing husbands and some secretly tried to find partners who suited them better ah that uh, i hey one minute have you been talking to my wife the point i'm getting at uncle is that these texts need to be read not as definitive indications of what happened we should instead search for the attitudes of the men who wrote them and read between the lines to understand why they say what they say all that is fine young man but if we hated women so much why would we have gargi in a debate hall arguing with other brahmins why you tell me well since you ask sir let's return to the sacrificial hall the old men had questioned yagnivalkya and he had defeated and silenced them all gargi has had enough she will make her final challenge and if yagnivalkya can answer this well she has other places to be other rivals to debate distinguished brahmins i am going to ask this man two questions if he can give me the answers to them then none of you will be able to defeat him in a theological debate i rise to challenge you yagnevalkya with two questions much as a fierce warrior son of kashi or videha stringing his unstrung bow and taking two deadly arrows in his hand would rise to challenge a rival give me the answers to them ask gargi the things above the sky the things below the earth and the things between the earth and the sky as well as all those things people here refer to as past present and future on what yagnyavalkya are all these woven back and forth on space gargi are all these woven back and forth all honor to you yagnyavalkya you really cleared that up for me get ready for the second tell me on what is space woven back and forth that gargi is brahman at whose command the sun and the moon the earth and the sky stand apart at brahman's command seconds and hours days and nights fortnights and months seasons and years stand apart rivers flow from the snowy mountains some to the east and others to the west without knowing brahman gargi even if a man were to offer sacrifices and perform austerities in this world for many thousands of years all that would come to naught pitiful is the man gargi who departs from this world without knowing brahman but a man who departs from this world after he has come to know this imperishable he gargi is a brahman on this very brahman gargi space is woven back and forth distinguished brahmins you should consider yourself lucky if you escape from this man by merely paying him your respects none of you will ever defeat him in a theological debate Ah see I told you I told you we made gargi superior to all brahmins except yagnyavalkya we even had her speak to him two times twice and look at what brilliant ideas we are exploring what do you have to say to that now tell me young man well okay let's begin with the way that gargi is represented keep in mind what we talked about earlier The Upanishads are being composed at a pivotal time for the Vedic school of the White Yajurvedans. 
these guys are writing the Brihadaranya ka Upanishad because they want to establish the superiority of their ideas in their region over their competitors and they're doing it by having Yagnivalkya defeat representatives of other schools in debate and we've also seen so far that they don't exactly have the healthiest attitudes towards women despite what our grumpy interlocutor is trying to claim so why indeed is gargi so prominent in the debate at janaka's court well the answer is just like ancient india kind of messy firstly the brihadaranyaka and many other upanishads mention theologians by the name of gargya or gargeya so just like yagnavalkya's other opponents in the debate gargi is a literary construct that the brahmin composers are using to represent their opponents from the gargeya families second by increasing the status of gargi the composers of the brihadaranyaka upanishad are trying to say that quote unquote even a woman has superior knowledge to the other rivals that is why gargi is depicted as silencing the other brahmins and that is why she declares to them that none of them will be able to defeat yagnavalkya one chap who disregards her decides to question yagnavalkya anyway and ends up with his head literally blown apart and finally it's quite significant that the brahmin men who compose the upanishad make gargi describe herself as a fierce warrior son of kashi or videha stringing his unstrung bow and taking two deadly arrows in his hand by putting her in the role of a man the composers are implying that gargi finally becomes equal to the great theologian but ultimately he their hero is still the one with the superior knowledge oh rubbish look here now you young person i am going to perform a ritual on you to turn you into a worm worm if you continue revealing our secret knowledge any further stop it you're just making that up now sir bye bye now no no enough i am making up nothing you don't disrespect me you children these days no respect for elders for culture for tradition nothing i challenge you to challenge me i will show you i will worm you worm you phew now we can talk so what does all this mean were all women in the late vedic period oppressed though not necessarily you see gargi isn't the only woman mentioned as having some sort of theological knowledge in other books of the brihadaranyaka upanishad yagnavalkya announces to his wives that he is going to retire to the forests one wife maitri asks him for all that he knows as a final settlement the other katyayani is described as one whose understanding is limited to womanly matters and she plays no further role in the upanishad So clearly in Indian history if we were to take these women and their representations as an example we have a situation where elite women are seen primarily as sex objects and domestic appliances but are sometimes allowed to enter what are considered masculine domains so it's certainly possible that some brahmins educated their wives and daughters but they seem to have been a minority after all it's difficult to imagine that the composers the brihadaranyaka upanishad would have imagined a woman participating in a theological debate out of nowhere so there might be a grain of truth in the depiction of gargi and there may indeed just like today have been women who had the social capital they needed to break free of traditional gender roles ancient india is not a utopia and the experience of ancient india was not the same for everyone a lot depended on your connections and your social and economic capital now we'll hear more from these privileged women later in this season All that being said, we know nothing at all about how women in other less literate sections of society were treated at this time. It's possible that without the expansive state, societal and religious institutions that evolved later in history, they were relatively better off. What about other castes and social groups at this time though? Well, the Upanishads make a big deal about how anyone can have knowledge of Brahman and have lots of episodes where their Brahmin heroes learn from say dogs bullocks kings and so on but given that the upanishads themselves were only ever meant to be taught to brahmins that's why they're called upanishads literally secret doctrine after all it seems more like a theoretical nod to the idea that all living beings come from the same stuff rather than an actual implementation of that in practice 
Now, it's important for us to kind of understand what was this Brahman or Brahman that Yagnivalkya was going on about. Clearly, by this time, around the 8th century BCE, the theology of elite Indians has moved well beyond the purely sacrificial ideas of the early Vedas. Let's explore this a little bit, because for all the antiquated social attitudes of the Upanishads, they have some really fascinating ideas that are well worth understanding today. Yagnivalkya has mentioned a new overriding concept, the idea of something beyond, the concept of something called Brahman, which is a warp and weft of reality itself. Remember that the Aryas once thought that sacrifice was a means of communicating with the heavenly world. Now, the Upanishads took that idea and asked, how does that actually happen? How is it that by doing stuff on the sacrificial ground, we are able to manipulate the cosmos? Surely there must be something that underpins both our world and the world of the gods. That something, as Yagnivalkya explained above, is Brahman. Our world and the heavens are woven onto the fabric of space, and space is woven on the fabric of Brahman. Brahman is the ultimate reality and it permeates us all. This, perhaps, is why Yagnivalkya says that Gargi's head will shatter apart when she inquires beyond Brahman in their first interaction, which we saw in the beginning of this episode. That, of course, combined with the misogyny that is so prevalent in early and modern Indian society. The Upanishads are also interested in a concept called Atman, the vital principle, the self. All living beings have it, and so too must Brahman. But if Brahman permeates all living beings, then they must both have the same vital principle. All things must be part of Brahman. And Brahman, this immeasurably grand principle that orders the cosmos itself, is part of all things. The famous Upanishadic line, I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. But of course, not everybody is privy to such secret knowledge. It is only the Brahmins who have access to it. And according to the Upanishads, since Brahmins are the only ones who know this great truth, even though everyone fundamentally has the same kind of Atman, this knowledge still sets Brahmins apart. Only Brahmins fully understand the rituals that they are doing. Now, doing in Sanskrit is described by the root word kr. Hence, by performing the ordained rituals correctly with knowledge of Brahman, Brahmins are properly fulfilling their karma and with it they will reap the rewards. According to the Brahadaranyaka Upanishad, the Atmans of Brahmins merge into Brahman when they die. So, what about everybody else? What happens to their Atmans when they die? Well, they are cremated and become smoke, and undergo a series of trippy transformations, merging into the night, the moon, the passing of the seasons, and whatnot. After a while, they become rain, spring up as food, turn into semen, and are then reborn. But according to the Chandogya Upanishad, it's only those whose behavior is pleasant that are reborn as Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras. Those of foul behavior enter, and I quote from Book 5, Chapter 5, Verse 7 of the Chandogya Upanishad, A foul womb, like that of a dog, a pig, or an outcast woman. Outcasts are considered as impure as animals in this formative time of Indian philosophy, and sadly, it's a legacy that remains with us today as much as the concepts of rebirth and Atman. According to the Upanishads, the vast majority of people who don't have sacred knowledge like Brahmins, who can't afford to perform their ritually ordained sacrifices like Kshatriyas, have nothing special to look forward to in their next birth. They'll become worms, snakes, insects, tiny creatures constantly revolving between birth and death. But at least if they're nicely behaved, there's a chance of being reborn as one of the high caste lordships who get to so confidently claim that they are superior to everyone else and possess knowledge which nobody else should have. But at least if they're nicely behaved, there's a chance of being reborn as one of the high caste lordships who get to so confidently claim that they are superior to everyone else and possess knowledge which nobody else should have access to. As you can imagine, that's not a very smart stance to take at a time when the world is changing when cities are changing, when societies are churning. Already by the time of the Upanishads, a trickle of people were beginning to leave the crowded towns and the overtaxed fields of the Gangetic Plains to become ascetics. Over the next century or two, 
the trickle would become a stream and then a great river and in its swirling waters would arise even more ideas about the nature of reality and humanity's place within it. And one day under a people tree, a man would sit and awaken to truth so powerful that they would shake the entire warp and weft upon which the society of the Vedas had been built and begin the epic narrative of India's great kingdoms and empires with a revolution unprecedented in the history of the world. I want to hear what you think of Echoes. And I also want to know what you've been up to since our last episode. Hit me up on Instagram at A-N-I-R-Y-U-D-D-H-A or on Twitter at A-K-A-N-I-S-E-T-T-I if you're looking for nerdy, irreverent Indian history content plus absolutely brilliant puns. You can also check out my YouTube channel, Connected Histories, and my meme essay page, The Chola Bhatura Empire, on Instagram for more funky Anirudh Kaniseti content. Hey, everybody, let me tell you a little bit about what happened on the IBM Podcast Network this week. We've had some amazing stuff, right? I mean, like, I don't know if you're aware of the redoing or the rebranding of the Traveling Professors show. We called it Now Smarter with Sid, which is our Deshmukh. This week, he examines Netflix getting into e-commerce, and will this affect how Amazon's dominating the space? Also, let me give you another quick hitch to join up on. So on Cyrus Says, Cyrus was joined by Olympic equestrian Imtiaz Anis, and Nishan Burla from the Triangle Offense podcast showed up on Thursday's Cock and Bull to talk about the NBA Finals. On Nan Kari Sadaf and Archie were joined by Kesha Chaturvedi of the Theatre Mede Raste podcast. On Storytellers and Story Sellers, we need to talk to Ashim Mathur from Dolby. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram to keep up with what's going on on the network. And with that, let me also just finally thank our sponsors there, what makes things possible. We'd like to thank Seat, Cred, Global Victoria, Bank of Baroda, Intuit India, and Lenovo. Thank you so much for making this possible. Come learn and experience the ABCDs of being queer with me, Shunetro. And me, Farhad. On our show, Gay BCD. The two of us take you through our stories and experiences of being gay men in the city of Mumbai and have candid and sometimes downright scandalous conversations about sexuality, gay culture, and everything in between. Catch new episodes of Gay BCD every Tuesday on the IBM Podcast website, app, or wherever you get all your podcasts from.